homes on this, the third Sunday in Advent. We have only one more Sunday to go before Christmas. And so this morning we'll be lighting the candle, the third candle on our Advent wreath, the candle of joy. Later in the service, our lead minister, John Carrick, will be preaching on the enigmatic figure of John the Baptist who came to prepare for the coming of Jesus. So as we begin our service, let's pray. We stand before the throne of God with countless crowds from every nation and race, tribe and language. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour, power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And we continue. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Good morning, St. Tom's. My name is Amos. Welcome at last to Updates at St. Tom's. I've been away for the past few weeks and a number of very exciting developments have occurred, so let's get straight to it. First off, some of you are seeing me inside the church building today. That's right, the 8.30 service is finally back. If you're one of those people in the 8.30 service, hi. I think I met some of you earlier in the week, that was wonderful, thank you. Now as you know, the 8.30 service is carried by volunteers like you. We're real short on volunteers for the month of December, especially with regards to cleaning on Saturday afternoons to keep the premise COVID safe, as well as greeters. However, if you'd like to serve your 8.30 congregation in any and every way, please speak to a pastoral staff or call the church office during the week. We're really hoping to start all of our services by 3rd of January pending health advice and advice from the diocese. So more information about that will be coming, stay tuned. Also, there will be no 10.30 stream service on 27th of December. I suspect many of you will be using a newfound freedom to go somewhere nice that Sunday anyway. There will still be the 8.30 in-person service however, so you're free to come. Next, I've got a frequently asked question. Are we meeting in the park this Sunday? If that's your question, the answer is yes. At noon on every Sunday, we'll be meeting at Wattle Park. Every second week, we'll also be celebrating Holy Communion together. So, after this stream service, don't switch off your TV and go about your Sunday. Join us at Wattle Park for some great Christian fellowship. Finally, allow me to leave you with this. Save the day, take our sins away. Who can rescue us with mighty power? Super Savior to the rescue, Super Savior, mighty to save. Look, look, here comes Jesus, up, up, and out of the grave. Super Savior to the rescue, Super Savior. Crusher, sin smasher, who's the mighty super savior? Jesus, he's a death crusher, sin smasher, who's the mighty super savior? Jesus. Save the day, take our sins away. Who can rescue us with mighty power? Super Savior to the rescue, Super Savior, mighty to save. Look, look, here comes Jesus, up, up, and out of the grave. Super Savior to the rescue, Super Savior.
Sing Tones. Hi, everyone. How are you? How was your week? I've been very busy preparing for Christmas, and I'm so happy seeing all these around me and doing the wrapping, preparing gifts for my friends. And I'm so joyful knowing that tomorrow I'm going to have a road trip with my family, and I'm going to meet. A good old friend. Long time we haven't seen each other. Well, I just mentioned something about being happy and joyful. Did you know what's the difference between happiness and joy? Hmm. Happiness is based on our circumstances and what is happening around you, but to be joyful is beyond being happy. There's delight and a kind of bliss involved in feeling joyful. When you experience the feeling of joy, you are joyful. For many people, like their wedding day, the birth of their children, mother and baby bonding, family together, or simply a beautiful summer afternoon. And when the kids go back to school campus after homeschooling, and we finally can meet each other in person in the park after months of hard lockdown, can all be joyful occasions. And what are some ways you express joy? If you were in, if you were an Israelite in Old Testament times, it would have looked like shouting for joy in worship, expressing delight in religious ceremonies, um, and reflecting of gladness over specific example of God's faithfulness. And the Bible tells us, joy comes from the Lord. In the New Testament, joy is not only expected. It is a good news to us. It is a praise-filled assurance that abides in us, reminding us that God is working everything out for our good and for His glory. Let's read these Bible verses. The Book of Matthew, chapter two, ten to eleven. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Why were they overjoyed? Because they saw the star, they saw hope. The Maggie knew that they're in the right direction, in the right way. They got the good news from the angel. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, as the glory of the Lord shone around those shepherds on the field. Remember, the angel said to the shepherds on the field, "Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy to all the people. The great joy is to all of us. However." Being joyful is not always easy, especially when we have really difficult days. Look back on this year, twenty twenty, the pandemic. Look back on those days we suffered during lockdown. The curfew, the stay at home, the empty city, the desolate playground, the stressful homeschooling, the Zoom fatigue. Happiness can fade away when life gets rough. Laughter may disappear when times get tough. Things will not always go our way, but being joyful is a choice we can make. The Bible tells us that we can choose to be filled with the joy of the Lord, because He gives food to the hungry. He gives sight to the blind. He lifts up who are bowed down. He 
He loves the righteous. He watches over the foreigners. He is our savior. He reigns forever. As I continue to prepare for Christmas, as you continue to prepare your heart for Christmas, take a moment to recognize the ways God once strengthened you through difficult situations. Take a moment to think about once you pray to have fun again with your friends in the park at the Blackburn Lake Park. At the end, it did happen. Just keep asking God to show you how He's using your hardship for His glory and your good. Today, I choose to joyfully praise the Lord that He had never failed me. How about you? What are you joyful about today? Now let's light the candles. First week, we lit up hope. Second week, peace. And this week, joy. Now let us pray. Dear God, it's because you came to Earth as a baby that we can experience unending joy. Now help us. To appreciate the birth of our Savior in a new way, would the joy of the Christmas story leap from the Bible and transform us? Dear God, prepare our hearts today, and receive Your glory. Amen. Each local church's mission is only as strong as people's willingness to participate in that mission. For the last two years, we at St Tom's have had a wonderful exemplar of participation in mission and service from our very own Matt Altman. Matt Altman has looked after the Tom's Crew program for two years now as our intern and has coordinated volunteers for the cooks so that kids have something to eat, has looked after a number of high school volunteers as they've taken up positions of leadership to be able to serve small children and has run a wonderful program for young kids after school on a Thursday at Tom's Crew. During 2020's long lockdown, Matt has been coordinating videos so that we can stay in touch with our kids and families from Tom's Crew. Hey guys, welcome to Tom's Crew. And he's made some real gems, including this one. So early the next morning, Moses got up and built an altar at the foot of the mountain And he set up 12 stone pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. 2, 10, 11, 12. And then they made sacrifices to God. Matt, you have done this job in an exemplary way, and it's been a joy to watch you do this, uh, dressing up as different characters, telling stories with uh, props and songs and rhymes, playing games with kids, the countless Lego pieces that have been stuck in your foot, the setting up, the emails, the coordinating, all of it has just been such a wonderful job. On behalf of the whole of St Tom's and all those who participated in Tom's crew with such joy over the last two years, thank you done a great job and we appreciate all that you've done to participate in God's mission with us at St Tom's. I think that if we can find that same sort of faith and trust in Jesus in our lives um, that we can do incredible things as well. So maybe that's too much. Bye for now. Today's reading comes from John chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, and verse 19 to 28. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, St. Tom's. We're at the third Sunday of Advent. Advent is a time when we remind ourselves of Christ coming into the world. And just that sentence, Christ coming into the world, needs some explaining. The words coming into denote entering from somewhere else. And indeed, if we would have read the context around our gospel reading today, we would have read that Jesus Christ is the creator of the world. It says nothing that exists would exist without him. He is God from all eternity, who has come into his own creation, stepped in to time, space and matter, our physical world. Three things I want to draw our attention to from the reading today. First is Christ is a light that has come into the world. Second, Christ's coming was expected. And third, Christ has been witnessed. These are all Advent themes. First, Christ is a light that has come into the world. Verses 6 to 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. If we were to read the whole of chapter 1, we would read that there are many titles or words used to explain who Jesus is, all of which are significant and give us this multi-dimensional view of Christ. Here the word light is used, and light becomes a theme throughout this gospel. How is it that Christ is a light? Jesus himself will say, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's in John 8, 12. John's gospel contrasts Jesus as being a light with the rest of humanity who are in darkness. And darkness conjures up Things that are unknown or opaque, fears and anxieties rise within darkness. A couple of years ago, um, the family went to Tasmania for a a trip around and we went to a place called Mole Creek. And at Mole Creek, you can go underground into some caves and look for glowworms. And um, our guide took us down deep into the cave. And once there was no natural source of light at all, she said, I'm going to turn the lights off just so that we can experience utter darkness. So she did. And within a few seconds, people were feeling their anxieties rise. She asked us, put your hand right in front of your face and see if you can see it. And you could see nothing at all. 
Some people began to feel dizzy. Now you could imagine what it would be like to live in constant darkness. A person who lives in darkness doesn't know themselves. They don't know what they look like. And the point of John's gospel is that human beings exist in a kind of darkness for which Christ alone is light. In fact, John's gospel says that he is the true light which enlightens everyone. He is our only hope. Second, Christ's coming was expected. That's the second point. The story of Christ's coming into the world did not just come out of the blue, did not just, uh, it wasn't simply that Jesus came and started a new religion, all of his own, based on himself. If I was to say to you that the bishop will be visiting, I will create some expectation in you. And the Old Testament sets up this expectation. It creates an expectation that there is a coming Messiah. And the word means Christ, anointed one from God coming into the world. And this is the backstory. And the odd questions to which are uh, posed towards John the Baptist. A little bit about John. John uh, has created something of a stir in first century Israel or Jerusalem. Uh, he is preaching and crowds are being drawn to him. And yet John is so different from any of the religious leaders of the time who look so respectable in their robes and their finery. And they, of course, are found around the temple. John gets around in clothing made of camel and uh, he eats grasshoppers, locusts and honey. He lives outside on the fringe. He is an odd one. And yet his preaching is so powerful. It is drawing people to him. And he is preaching that Jews should be baptized. Baptism at that time was something that was used for converts to Judaism from uh, Gentiles. So if you were an Egyptian or a Greek and you were attracted to the religion of Judaism and to the God of Israel, you would, among other things, be baptized. And yet John is preaching a baptism of repentance, but for Jews. So he's creating this kind of stir and the religious elite uh, send delegation from the capital uh, to John. Now uh, let's read their dialogue. Verse 19, this is the testimony given by John when the Jews, that's the religious elite, sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. Let's stop here. John understands what they're asking. This is not a simple ID check. You know, what's your full name? Who are you? John knows they are wondering, could he be the Messiah, the Christ? Or perhaps more likely, they're wondering, does John think he's the Messiah? See, there's an expectation set up by the Old Testament that the Messiah, Christ, was coming. People were expecting. Let's continue. Verse 21. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. This is a little perplexing here because it seems that there, there wasn't simply an expectation that a Messiah was coming, but also Elijah and the prophet. They asked the question, are you Elijah? Because the prophet Malachi prophesied 400 or so years earlier these words. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And that's how the Old Testament ends, pretty much with those words ringing in our ears. It's the final word. Elijah will return before the day of the Lord. See, the story of Elijah as well in the Old Testament, found it, I think, in 2 Kings, is filled with great drama and wonder. And his departure was no less dramatic because he didn't die. 
you may recall, he went up in a chariot of fire. And so there was this speculation based on the last words of Malachi the prophet in the Hebrew Bible and the fact that Elijah didn't die, that Elijah would return before the Messiah came. That was the speculation. That's what was believed. But when they ask, are you Elijah? John says, I am not. But this kind of creates a little bit of difficulty in the gospel narratives because in Matthew eleven fourteen, Jesus himself says about John the Baptist, he is Elijah who was to come. So how is this resolved? The best way of understanding John the Baptist, is he Elijah or not, is found in the gospel of Luke. Zechariah, who is John's father-to-be, receives a message while he is ministering in the temple, a message from an angel about the son, John, who will be born. And the message picks up on the prophecy to Malachi. Luke 1.17, And he, John, will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. That's the words of the angel. John the Baptist is not Elijah, but he is so like Elijah, a powerful prophet. As we might say, he is cut from the same cloth. John is not Elijah, but there are some strong similarities. And that's what Malachi was pointing to. Next, they ask him, are you the prophet? He answers, no. Notice the question is not, are you a prophet, but are you the prophet? There was an expectation of a particular prophet to come. This expectation comes about because of something Moses said in his final sermon, the book known to us as Deuteronomy. In chapter 18, verse 15, Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. So Moses points forward to a significant prophet like himself. And we get the hint of this prophet's significance. In verse 19 of the same chapter, the Lord says, I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. By the time of Christ, it is evident that there were a number of expectations about possibilities of a prophet, of Elijah, of the Messiah coming to the world. But the Gospels point to Christ as being the prophet that Moses spoke of. For at the transfiguration of Jesus in Matthew 17, a passage which has amazing parallels to the life of Moses, and coincidentally both Moses and Elijah appear with him there at transfiguration, God's voice is heard and he commands the disciples to Listen to him, Jesus, picking up those same words said about the prophet to Moses. Listen to him. All expectation in the Old Testament points forward to Jesus Christ. Third, Christ was witnessed. If the Old Testament points forward to Christ's coming, the New Testament witnesses, testifies to his having come. The words uh, witness and testify are legal type of words. You know, courtrooms have witnesses who testify. And the word witness becomes a theme through John's gospel. So the Samaritan woman of John chapter 4 bears witness in her hometown. John 4:39 Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, Jesus, because of the woman's testimony. The works of Jesus, what he does also bear witness. 
and prove a point. So John says, uh, Jesus says of himself in John 5.36, I have a testimony weightier than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. Jesus says that God the Father also bears witness in John 8.18. 8, I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. And the Old Testament themselves are said to bear witness. When Jesus says to the uh, religious leaders and those who study the scriptures, he says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think you have life by them. They are the very scriptures that testify about me. More could be added here. The crowds bear witness to Jesus. The Holy Spirit bears witness to Jesus. The apostles bear witness to Jesus. And the point is this. A case has been made for who Jesus is. And this point is made so that all might believe. And we see that in the reading today, speaking about John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. The Old Testament points forward to Christ, to his coming. The New Testament testifies he has come. Okay, well, let's recall what we have heard. First is Christ is a light that has come into the world. He is the light who enlightens us. He is our only hope. Christ's coming, number two, Christ's coming was expected. He was foretold. And this speaks powerfully to us, to the truth of Jesus Christ. And third, Christ has been witnessed. The testimony that it has happened. The whole New Testament points to the actuality that Christ has come. This is the case set before us at Advent. We are reminded of these things. But additionally, we are reminded that Christ will return. And this is the other side of Advent, remembering Christ the King will come again as he has promised. One of the reasons for using the color purple uh, during Advent is because purple historically was the color associated with royalty. Purple dye was very difficult to make and therefore very expensive. Uh, purple robes were worn by royalty. It was a regal color. And so some church traditions, including Anglican, we use purple during Advent, reminding us that we Christians are a people preparing for the coming of the King. How do we do this? Well, John the Baptist's message was about preparing for Christ, and he tells us to be baptized as a sign of repentance. And that message hasn't changed for us. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Baptism is a sign of entering new life, living differently. Now, I will point to three things that John the Baptist says, in addition, as examples for how to prepare for Christ's coming. First is, live in the wonder of Christ's greatness. Second, live in the wonder of what Christ does. Third, live in the spirit that Christ gives. So first, live in the wonder of Christ's greatness. John says in verse 27, The one who is coming after me, Jesus, I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. In other words, Jesus is of such profound worth and greatness to John that his own self-estimation has been utterly humbled. And yet the amazing thing is that Jesus, when speaking about John, says this in Matthew 11:11, 11, 11, truly I tell you, 
Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet John understands that he is not worthy even to assume the role of a slave for Jesus. That is far above him. Christ is of infinite worth. And as we grow in our understanding of his worth, we cannot fail to be humbled in ourselves. Jesus is worthy of our wholehearted devotion. As the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, states, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Second, live in the wonder of what Christ does. Verse 29, John the Baptist says, well, it says, The next day he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him, and he declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ has dealt with what separates you and I from God. He has dealt with what gives us guilty conscience. He has dealt with our darkness. Our sin is taken away by Christ. Live in the wonder of what Christ does for you. The third is live in the spirit that Christ gives. In John 1 verse 33, the Baptist says again, I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. From Christ, we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's through the Spirit we are to seek to live our transformed lives. Amen. Well, let me pray. Dear Father, prepare us for your Son's coming. Jesus Christ, our rightful Lord and King, Grant us a growing understanding of his worth, that he might be in our heart's treasure. Cause us to hope solely in him, the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. And baptize us in your Holy Spirit, so that we might live as your sons and daughters, glorifying you in Christ's name and likeness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one that could ever song we could
could ever say Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Cause holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to the Let's stand, if you feel you would like to, to affirm our faith together in the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Come now to a time of confession. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God desires that none should perish, but that all should turn to Christ and live. In response to his call, we acknowledge our sins. God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians assures us, God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Hi St. Tom's, how's it going? It's Xavier here and I um, hope you're all going well and had a good week. Um, I'm going to do, to do the prayers out here in the really nice parkland around Blackburn. As you can see it's really nice and just shows God's amazing creation. So um, we'll bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, we pray that you help us just January overall, just just for this week and the coming days and with all the changes at the moment and, and with everything happening in the world. I pray Lord that you help us not to be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Dear Lord, we pray for unity at the moment in the world, in Australia especially in terms of our leaders and governments and the tough decisions they have to make and with COVID-19 and the current um, increase in cases overseas and the, the terrible situation and the terrible situation happening over there. Dear Lord, we just really, really pray that you give them wisdom and strength and knowledge during this time, especially the leaders overseas and our leaders here in Australia who Continue to, continue to try to protect us from COVID through the, the quarantine um, program and the strong borders. We pray you give them wisdom, know what the right thing to do is in the situation, um, ca care for the people they are serving, um, Lord, and representing, and help them to consider all options, Lord. We just pray that, yeah consider all options and be able to choose the right option. May you help us to be resilient, to continue to trust you, Lord, to really trust you, to open our heart to you, Lord, and just really focus on you, Lord, and not on all the, the, the stressful, stressful situations around the world and all the changes in Australia around the world in terms of COVID restrictions and work and Christmas. 
pray we just really focus on you, Lord. And, and dear Lord, um, I just really want to pray for all those at the moment who you know, are really sick at the moment. Um, especially for um, people at St. Tom's, you know, who are sick and unwell, who are having surgery or in hospital. Um, we pray for Nolene, you know, that she's okay and recovering. We, yeah, we just pray for everybody coming in our church and in all other churches who are suffering due to pain and illness. We pray that you look over them. Give them wisdom, give them strength to push on, Lord, and know that you love them, you care for them, and you love them so, so much, so, so much, that you give your son to die on the cross. And dear Lord, I just pray for, I just pray for, as an, um, in terms of recent discussions, um, we pray for unity, Lord, in terms of the church overall, and in the recent division and discussion about uh, Victorian and, and, Victor and Victorian bill around um, conversion, um, do you know? I just pray that um, that others, other, all churches can come together in unity, can really um, continue to spread your word and discuss any differences in a very. Um, in a very nice and productive way. We pray, Lord, we especially also pray, for, Lord, for all that, for the summer missions coming up, um, for the Scripture Union missions, COs, and all, for all the people in St. Thomas who are part of those and helping out, and also for the, um, for such, also in Jan, um, as well, Summer Under the Sun, and also um, for the youth program there. We pray that for the people helping prepare for those programs, we give them wisdom and strength and knowledge and how to prepare and getting the getting the resources and knowing how to help um, the, the people they are looking after know you, Lord, and know your amazing love and grace. And dear Lord, um, we really also pray, you know, for everybody as well, the parents, everybody that are um, during the upcoming Christmas break and New Year that we are able to get some rest and you know, visit your amazing country and uh, nature just like I am in now. And yeah, and just be able to focus on you and see your love and grace and replenish the energy. And we pray for many people now who are back to work and working really hard before Christmas. We pray that you give them energy and strength to continue working, to get their work done before Christmas, to know that um, they, you know, by working, they're actually serving you, Lord, and um, that you know you care for them and um, watching over them and uh, helping them and giving them wisdom to help complete their work so yeah do you want to pray all of this and pray for yeah um, pray for all this in your name um, Amen
this point in the service, if we were meeting together, we would take up a collection. But most people at St Thomas give electronically. And we're grateful that our ministry and the ministry of St Thomas Hope has been able to continue because of your generosity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us riches beyond measure. We can only return a fraction of what we owe you. But we ask, Lord, that you will bless our, offer our offerings and help us to use them wisely in your service and for your glory. Amen. And so we come to the end of our service. Eternal God, you sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for the coming of your Son. Grant us wisdom to see your purpose and openness to hear your will, that we too may prepare the way for Christ, who is coming in power and glory to establish his rule of peace and justice. Through Jesus Christ, our Judge and our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us with your word, and encouraging us in our meeting together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We hope you'll join us for a picnic lunch at Wattle Park from uh, 12 midday onwards. May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in you what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Um.